Thank you all for coming. My name is Patrick Halley. I'm the executive director of the Next Generation 911 Institute. We're a nonprofit organization uh, whose mission is to raise awareness uh, and put on events like this uh, to educate folks on important issues affecting the 911 system in the United States. Uh, so today we have a, a great uh, panel that will discuss cybersecurity issues uh, within the 911 and the broader emergency communication system as we move towards next generation 911 uh, and next generation communications capabilities for emergency responders. So let's just get started. I, I will say, having listened to Marsha, I'm, I'm, and, and in general, I'm um, equally excited about the opportunities of Next Generation 911 and the Internet of Things and all of the different capabilities that it enables for uh, consumers, for emergency responders. Um, but I'm also equally concerned, as I think we all should be, and this is not just true for public safety, but communications generally, uh, about potential cybersecurity risks. And um, there's no doubt that they exist. It's just a question of how we manage them. So in interested in having a discussion about that today. So let's just start with 911. Uh, it's the 50th anniversary of 911 this year. First call was made in 1968. <clears throat> it was just a telephone call over a telephone network, and that's what 911 was, and in some cases still largely is. It's still a telephone sort of voice-based system. Um, so I guess the first question is, with the legacy system, I think folks perhaps think that there are fewer, less, or no risks associated with cybersecurity. Um, is that correct, or are there, in fact, risks associated with the legacy 911 system? Whoever wants to take it can jump in. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that, Alex. So. Um, Briefly, I think that it would be a mistake to think that the current system has no risk at all. We've seen attacks against the current system, whether it's a simple TDOS attack or uh, ransomware. So there's certainly points of ingress to the legacy system. Less so, um, less sophisticated attacks on the telephony side, but nonetheless, certainly an attack surface, and I think... Uh, Teddy and some others who are in the business right now can tell you that a PSAP is an attractive target, and therefore they have certainly been uh, hit. And even in a legacy environment, we have a risk we need to mitigate and response plans that we need to come up with. So I'll pass it off to someone else with that intro. Well, you mentioned a TDOS. So what is a telephone denial of service attack? And so uh, telephony denial of service basically uses the phone lines the, um, to attack the, the capability of any center to process calls. Typically on the PSAP side, what we've seen and the worst attack we saw, I was uh, cohort of the guy next to me on the right here at the time, we saw the 12 state TDOS attack against 911. First time ever, 911 as a number was actually targeted successfully. Typically it hits administrative lines and what happens is it's like ordering a pizza. Uh, you order one pizza and it shows up at your house and you're happy. You order one pizza and it shows up at your house and one second later a second pizza shows up, you might still be happy. But if a second after that the third pizza shows up and that keeps happening for 60 seconds, you are no longer happy. Um, if you multiply that by 100, that's what the equivalent of a TDOS attack is on the telephone system for any kind of... Uh, any kind of call answering center. So in a PSAP environment, what we typically saw was the, the telephony denial of service attack targets the administrative lines of the PSAP. The administrative lines are typically tied into the 911 system. The administrative lines are overburdened and the call takers are overburdened and they're not able to process the 911 calls because they are too busy handling the administrative calls. Often now they'll break away from the admin lines, put a priority on the 911 side, but it really depends on how the PSAP is set up as to what impact a 10-digit admin line attack has on the 911 system as a whole. So, so is it is it only 10-digit numbers? I mean, why couldn't you do a TDAS attack that just literally started just dialing 911? Well, that, that happened one time, and it happened um, in 12 states and dozens of PSAPs, and the way that that came about was that the perpetrator used Twitter and a shortened Google link, and he sent out a message, and the two lines of JavaScript that he wrote actually uh, exploited a vulnerability in a phone operating system to get through to 911. Typically, though, 
it's very difficult to TDOS 911 directly because of the way the legacy trunks are constructed. So we, we had not seen 911 as a target number. We had seen the admin lines and the PSAPs targeted in typical attacks, but the, the 911 attack that occurred was certainly an eye-opener. There were protections in place. Those change as you move into an IP environment. I'm sure, sure others at the table can talk about that. <clears throat> Teddy, maybe from your perspective, as somebody who who's, has to you know, handle these types of issues within the, the Office of Unified Communications, um, my understanding is that perhaps you have had to deal with a TDOS attack in the past. And could you talk a little bit about how you know what's happening, how you respond to it, and how to prevent it? <clears throat> yeah, usually, uh, you know, when we start uh, noticing these types of issues is when the call center gets bogged down with a huge volume of calls, um, um, something that doesn't follow an ongoing daily pattern. I mean, we know our call volumes for different seasons and things like that, and we can monitor how well we're performing for a given day. Um, the challenge becomes that hour to hour determining between a major accident and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of calls coming in versus um, that one off that that attack is starting to happen. And a lot of times, what happens? It comes in a low volume and it keeps increasing and. And over time, it just bogs down the system. So that's that's kind of how we monitor in the past. I mean, we're putting things in place now to be able to monitor higher volume calls from the same number. Sometimes it depends how the call is coming in, if it's using the same phone number or a piani. How do you determine it's the same caller? And those kind of things are becoming more and more challenging. So as time goes on, we're trying to come up with ways of at least you know you know doing the analytics so we we can do a little bit better of recognizing when those when those things happen. Interesting. So in some ways, it's yeah. right. We, we can't not answer 911 calls, right, typically, right? I, our, our responsibility is to answer the call if it's coming in. Um, and it's difficult to just start blocking calls, I imagine. So it's, I imagine that's kind of a challenge. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, so uh, I, gave a, I gave a talk with um, a, a co-presenter, Trey Fogarty, who used to be the director of government affairs at, at Nina, uh, who now works over at Apple. And we presented at DEF CON about two years ago. DEF CON is a giant hacking conference, right? It's like 40,000 people show up. We had like a little over 1,000 people in our room. And we did what we think is the first work of real published insight into next generation 911 hacking. And one of the ways that we were able to exploit next generation 911, I know that we're still talking about 911, but it's on this, it's on this one simple premise. All calls must go through. Right? You, you have no ability to fail over a call, to offline a call. You have to take the call because every call is potentially a life-saving incident. This is the single biggest problem in 911 is that you don't have the ability to reject traffic, right? which is what you would normally do if you were like Amazon. They would just say, sorry, you know, this, this circuit switch connection or this packet, we're just going to black hole it. It's not going to happen. In, you can flag things, um, especially in an IP network like 911. You can treat traffic differently, but all calls must go through, which means that you have no points of failure that can exist in the system. And the, the easiest way for attackers to exploit systems is to find you know, small vulnerabilities in serial, so like in a line, and take them out one by one by one. The, the large problem with 911 is that you're in a high availability mission critical network, and so you have to accept all the traffic. And this is a really tough technical issue of in that environment where we know that we have to accept everything, how do then we then make a series of prioritized assumptions and decisions that are thoughtful about cybersecurity when we don't have insight into that information, right? Until you open up and inspect that packet, until you allow uh, the call to go through, you don't really have a good understanding outside of the heuristical information, right, that Teddy was talking about. We set this baseline, we see these things every day, so we understand what the general parameters are, but that's generalized information, and a good attacker will understand that this is their method of operations, right? They set a baseline, I'm going to come in just a millimeter above that baseline and launch my attack. Um, and that's how successful exploitation happens, is they understand their target, they understand their operating methods, you're in a high availability network you, where you can't make mistakes, and exploitation becomes trivial. Well, so let's let's talk about distributed denial of service, yeah. right? Because that's that's and I, that's about as much as I know about the term DDoS. So cool, cool, just cool. Feeded my yeah. knowledge. <laughs> no. I'm looking for you guys to help me out. So maybe one of the other panelists can talk a little bit more about <clears throat> you know telephone denial of service. To me, seems pretty simple. It's basically can I get enough calls going in that are greater in volume than the number of people or lines available to answer them. But on the DDoS side, I mean, sort of what is a d distributed denial of service attack? And, and let's talk a little bit about that. 
Well, I'm not qualified to talk about what it is per se because I was going to explain rather how the cloud mitigates for that. So maybe someone else can start that and I'll come back in over the time. Sure, yeah, I would, and I would love to talk about the cloud because yeah. I think a lot of services in general are moving to cloud-based solutions, including in the public safety sector. And whether or not, uh, I, I hear some people say that you know, using the cloud is risky. I also hear cybersecurity experts say that in fact, it may actually be better to have things in the cloud from a cyber. There's a great sticker about cloud computing that you can get on like Etsy or Amazon. It's just the cloud is just somebody else's computer, right? That's literally all it is. Now, there's a lot of benefits that you can get from using somebody else's compute, right? But it's still at the end of the day, it's a machine that exists somewhere in the world and you have to trust it. Um, somebody want to talk yeah, about but what is, yeah, Anyone else on DDoS, just sort of laying it out? Well, let's, let's actually go back to 911. There's this concept that old 911 systems are somehow um, not as vulnerable to TDOS type attacks. Actually, I will argue that they are significantly more vulnerable, yeah. um, greatly more vulnerable, because in an NG scenario, you have the ability to do packet inspection. You have the ability to reject traffic. You have the ability to filter traffic. You do not have that ability in traditional 911. Mm -hmm. You do have it in SIP. So that's an interesting interpretation, and that's something that could be more clearly interpreted. But it's a question of is it a 911 call or is it a data flow? Yeah. Right? So at least it's possible. You then have to obviously construct to do that. So with TDOS, the thing that we haven't seen yet, and there's just no good reason we haven't seen it, it just hasn't come up yet, is for a massive TDOS yeah. on 911 straight on 911. There's no reason it can't happen. There's nothing preventing it from happening. And frankly, it's horrifying because there's really no way to stop it right now. Legally, by the time as a CLEC I can engage it, I'm already impacted by it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I can do. So as a CLEC, if I try to filter those calls, or if I try to make any adjustment to those calls, eh, it's not going to, you know, orange jumpsuit, bracelet, it's no good, right? You can't do it legally as a CLEC. Yeah. With an NG, it is possible to do it. So with a DDoS, all a DDoS is is an arbitrarily large amount of traffic from multiple sources hitting a target. And so, so hopefully, you know, if I'm a DDoS operator, what I've done is I've compromised everybody's cell phones and I have them just throwing little bits of packets out so that you don't understand that your cell phone's doing something naughty. Yeah. But on the, re, on, the, on the target end, they're just getting crushed by all the cell phones in the world because of whatever. So it's simply a resource depletion attack typically affecting the ingress pipes. NG911 as a concept is not vulnerable to it at the current time because most of those OSP handoffs to IPSRs, which is originating service providers down to the, down to the routers, are private lines. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no public exposure to it. You can't defend it, but it's also not, not subject to being attacked. However, with geoinformatics coming in, yeah. now it's a different world because now you have the PSAP actually opening up to the internet having to run queries out to the cloud, to AWS, or to whoever. And as soon as that opens up, now we're, now we're cooking with gas, so to speak. Now we're live on the internet, and we're very vulnerable to a, to a DDoS attack. And all a DDoS attack does is it clogs your ingress pipes, or you throw in a bunch of carefully crafted and very massive amount of carefully crafted packets, yeah. and you crash switches, routers, firewalls. You negatively impact the technology. Um, and there are... There are very defensible if you've pre-structured, yeah. pre-structured to defend. So, so there, there, there is, though, to answer your question in another way, there, there are three ways, there are three levels of denial of service attack, right? So what, uh, what Dan just described is like, is a, there's this model of the internet, seven layer model of the internet called the OSI model. And that's a layer three and four attack, right? Where I have this volume of data, this volumetric attack. So like, think small pipe, lots of water, right? You want to put a ton of water through a straw, you're going to bust the straw, right? It's just not going to go anywhere. It's going to flow over the straw. Um, and so that's, th those are our, 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 our data, our, our network and session links. Then we have this other layer called SIP or session initiation protocol. It's actually called the, the session layer in the OSI model. And one of the things that's interesting about SIP, it's like a, it's a voice over IP call routing protocol. It's one of the many things that it does, right? One of the interesting things about SIP is that it requires a certain quality of service. Quality of service basically means that when I send a packet that I want it to be received in a way in which that session of calls is not particularly poorly disrupted. So if you have like a ton of latency in the line, a SIP session may drop. 
So another attack that attackers can launch, and one attack that myself and Trey Fogarty launched at DEF CON was we attacked the session layer. And what we basically did was we, we created so many hangups in a SIP session that it was impossible to um, obtain the level and quality of service that SIP as a standard requires in order to initiate the session. So imagine like what would happen if you were trying to have a conversation with somebody and they just hung up on you like, 55,000 times in two seconds. That's basically what we did. That actually against, has happened to me once. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he's not a very engaging speaker. So, uh, yeah, so, so, so you, can, you can disrupt this quality of service to such an extent that you take the availability of the resource away and SIP as a protocol shuts it down. And then we have a last layer of denial of service attack, which is this thing called an application layer, right? And, and this is the stuff that Rapid Deploy builds, right? An app or an application, you have them on your phones, an operating system is an application, you have applications in your devices, and what you can do is you can interrupt the quality of the application. You can launch what's called an application layer attack, and there's tons of ways to do that, but that's usually exploiting code as opposed to exploiting services, as opposed to exploiting volume. Right? So we have three ways to launch a denial of service attack on one target. And a good attacker will use all of those ways and phishing. And also they'll come to your place and try and snip the wires outside of your public safety answering point. Right? They'll do anything that they can to do that. But it's important to distinguish that there are three ways to do denial of service attack. And right now we only have a regulatory framework to manage layers three and four. The only thing that the FCC is responsible for is the network and the, uh, is the network and uh, uh, the yeah, the network and the data layer, right? Anything above that is outside of a regulatory structure. So, so Rob and then and Steve as well as, as providers who are are and Dan selling into the public safety market. Um, how do you how do you handle this? How do you prepare for all this? What is the what are the best practices that industries out there looking at? Well, when you talk specifically about the legacy nine one one, you know you introduce uh, something we haven't talked about, and that's that's physical security. You touched on mm -hmm. it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but also the education of the individuals that work with inside the facility. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody on this panel and probably quite a few in the room will agree that, that people are, uh, are a pretty big risk. Your weakest link. That's right. Yeah. You know? And the best way to mitigate that is to inform them uh, what they possibly could do wrong. You know, uh, people aren't al algorithms. People aren't, uh, you know, we have emotions. We, ha we make decisions, and those decisions are based on a certain mindset at a particular time where, where technology doesn't do that. So what we do, you know, Hamilton is a provider of 911 because we are in 22 state contracts for relay services. And so we have the ability to um, educate our people, um, education first and foremost, but um, Really, a close second is to is, is to take a step back and look at all the different things that that we provide to the customer. We should be we should be the ones that are telling them what controls should be in place. You know, mm -hmm. and we were talking about this prior to the panel, is to take a step back and and really do a, a, a third party, us being the third party for the piece app or for the customer, to give them the assessment that hey, this is where you're vulnerable. You may be doing this well, but you're not doing that well, and we can help you do that. And so really educating the, the individuals and then taking a third-party assessment look at, at, the, at the PSAP in this particular case as a whole and then come up with a, um, a cybersecurity plan for, for implementation purposes. So, you know, that's, that's, really, that's really what we bring to the table is the ability to take a step back and um, mm. out of the box perspective. Yeah, and then we're at the the other end of the stick. So we're at the you know, point of ingress um, at the application layer, as Alex mentions. You know, so we run an HTML5 site for CAD as opposed to running a Windows client, thick client, legacy, old-fashioned solution. So um, on the back of that, we're not subject to the kind of ransomware attacks that we've seen in some piece apps recently because we're not waiting for Symantec to, or similar antivirus to update to protect our CAD. Our CAD is protected by the Azure Gov framework, in our case, Microsoft's um, Gov uh, data center, which, you know, if you look at Microsoft's data center at, at, uh, at large, that's the most DDoS data centers on the planet. 
right? And that, that's actually a place you want to be as opposed to your own PSAP, which never gets DDoS till that one occasion where someone's trying to wipe you out. Mm -hmm. So in the case of us hosting within the Zurgo framework, um, we uh, allow ourselves to be protected by the multi-billion dollar investment that Microsoft makes every year with their telematics and defense team defending those environments. So we'd much rather PSAP host their data and for the integrity within that environment than had um, two IT guys in the basement trying to look after you know, a rack of iron. And, uh, and, and then you um, compound your um, resilience by having a geo-resilience. So we have two data centers that we're keeping in sync at all times, and we can fail over between them if one data center was taken out. And then uh, uh, the last point, sorry, Alex, just um, in an incredible worst-case scenario, if there were, and, and it is not impossible, let me just state it is not impossible um, to issue a, a, a ransomware attack on a cloud-based solution. Right? It is incredibly hard, and the way we mitigate, because you know, anything can be attacked, right? the way we mitigate against uh, things being attacked is we try and make this an expensive exercise for the attackers. Right? It's time and resources that they have to put into that to make that happen. So in, in, in the rapid de deploy scenario, in an absolute worst case scenario, we can roll back, just going back a day, and that'll invalidate everything else that's happened. Where if you have a legacy, um, a typical solution that we have in computer dispatch in today's environment, um, they'll be literally having to wipe firmware on machines and, re, you know, and start from scratch. So your point of recovery becomes a massive point in your point of resilience as well. So well, you, you mentioned ransomware. Let's talk about that because, well, first of all, specifically, let's talk about what ransomware is and, and maybe, Mark, from the perspective that I know you guys are working with a lot of different public safety agencies, what do you, first, well, somebody explain what it is in case people aren't familiar, but also what do you do? What's the best practice when somebody has successfully hacked into your system and is demanding payment, essentially? So uh, fundamentally, ransomware is a hacker uh, penetrates an application. Oftentimes, it's the resident CAD application. They uh, encrypt database or core files. Legacy CAD. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. I just really want to put it down on that. Okay. The hacker encrypts uh, core files to the CAD application, rendering it useless, causes delay in 911 call processing because the CAD application is no longer usable. Uh, delays in 911 call processing are obviously life-threatening events. Also, you get a Bitcoin ransom note, Bitcoin enabling the hacker to obtain funding anonymously, uh, makes this all work very cleanly for the hacker. And the 911 entity, if they don't have appropriate backups, if they're not prepared, a, a common theme in all of the threats we've discussed here today, uh, has little choice but to pay the ransom. Uh, over a billion dollars paid out over at least a, a minimally the last year to, to 18 months. So very, very- Not, not public safety specifically, you just in, in general, correct? Correct. Yeah. So, well, and, so, oh, sorry. The caveat on that a little bit, you know, I think, I don't, I don't know exactly what percentage is. I know it's in the 60s, but um, 60 some odd percent of the individuals that pay the ransom yeah. don't get their data back anyway. You know, and so dealing with criminals. That's right. Yeah, and and so you you think about you know the services that Hamilton provides. You think about when you go out to a peace app or you go out to a network um, of any sort, whether private sector, government, military, whatever it is, and you ask those individuals, what's your best recourse for um, getting back online after a ransomware attack? A lot of them don't know that the answer is good backups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and correct. And, and being able to tell those people not only how, that that's the answer, but also how to uh, implement those solutions is really one of the only ways to get back in, as fast as possible. So, so uh, th think about a ransomware attack like in the following way. Have you ever forget, forgotten your password to your laptop? So your password is probably like four or six digits. Um, and so like given enough time, you could guess it, right? You could just go through every single iteration of that combinate, well, actually permutation of four six-digit six code, and you could figure out what the right one is. Now imagine that that, that four six-digit code is 256 digits, mm -hmm. and you need to hit them all right in sequence. That's just for one machine. Um, the way that ransomware generally deploys is that they um, issue a RSA 256-bit private key, which is what you would use if you were a systems administrator to log into like, 
in Amazon Web Services machine, right? So like a really strong, resilient key that's really hard to break, but they're bad guys. And so you would want to break the bad guys key, right? But they're using exactly the same infrastructure that you are. And so they take that private key, they put it on your machine, and they encipher it. But they don't just encipher your machine. They encipher everything in the data center. They encipher all of your backups. They encipher absolutely everything. So the city of Atlanta was attacked by what's called um, a big, uh, ransom by Bitcoin, and they were forced to pay out through Bitcoin, exactly to Mark's point. And um, basically, they, didn't, they hadn't been taking any backups of any of their infrastructure. And so they had nothing to restore back to. Because you can go back to the moment immediately before that attack is launched, and you can just restore from that moment. But if you're not backing anything up, you have nothing to restore from. The underlying systemic problem of this, and I think what we're all kind of dancing around and getting at, is states are generally underfunded entities who do not have resources to hire competent IT staff to do the actual work. MSSP, and and it's, not, it's, not, it's not an indictment of state or local governments. It's just that they don't have the budgets, right? Like, you know, uh, if I were to go out and, you know, get on the free market as, like, a, a chief information security officer, I'd probably make... Two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The maximum amount of money that, like, the state of Colorado, where I live, can pay somebody, it's like one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Why would I half my salary to do not particularly interesting work? And so the answer to a lot of this is you outsource to a managed services provider, yeah. like a Hamilton, like a Rapid Deploy, like a lot of other vendors who can hire the best talent and disperse that cost across an entire client list. And so what you end up getting, like what you do with Microsoft is you get badasses who like work for Microsoft and they make a quarter million dollars and they have stock options. So what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. No. It's just not the way the public safety operates. They operate generally with a box that sits in a basement that a guy with a bunch of keys goes and manages every once in a while. And this guy named Steve comes in from a place that you don't know right. and he just takes your records. That's the future. And he could, be, he could as well be the janitor for all that you know. Um, and like, But that's how the House of Representatives used to work. Like when I worked here, we did everything in the congressional office, and we had a guy named Jason who came, and he took all of the stuff out of the computer, and he disappeared somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, like, no one knew who he was, and no one knew why that was happening, but that's just how they operated. And then the, the House Administrative Office was like, that's wrong. We're going to go to cloud computing, and you're not going to have a server that sits <clears throat> underneath the desk where your intern sits and eats his lunch. Well, and then a lot, so, of, well, a lot of the time, that's not the... That, that's not the let, just, me, uh, let me jump in real oh, quick. sorry, Jason. The, um, so as the... Uh, underpaid, unqualified individual in the government space for 30 <laughs> years. Um, let me jump to the defense of some of our public safety folks. First of all, they certainly are underfunded compared to corporate America. Yep. However, uh, I think you'll find that the reason people are willing to take $130,000 salary instead of $250,000 is because they're incredibly dedicated to the mission. So when you look at 911 call takers, uh, public safety telecommunicators across the spectrum, the administrators, the CAD folks, the GIS folks, the people who manage the PSAPs, they're not there to get rich. Uh, I did not raise my right hand as a police officer to become a millionaire. My mother still thinks it was a lobotomy, but um, <laughs> I spent 20 years on the job and then another decade running PSAPs for dedication to the mission, and that's what you have out there. And you have folks who want to accomplish the mission who need help yeah. from the yeah. vendor community, the service provider, yeah. provider community. And quite frankly, one of the things that we're seeing is where people can be your weakest link, they're also your strongest link. If you properly train them, that, that frontline telecommunicator is going to be the one who finds the leading edge of that attack. If you don't have analytics in place in your PSAP, if you don't have the benefit of some of the federal models or some of the larger uh, corporate capabilities, you do have talented, dedicated folks sitting on the front line who will notice that uptick, who will see some anomalies, who are trained to handle emergency situations every day. And they'll, if you properly train them and give them the opportunity, they'll be your best asset where they can obviously be the weakest link as any human, they can also be the, that one person who helps you identify before it becomes a major issue the fact that a cyber attack has started. And, and to that end, one of the things I'd like to do is toss something over to Dusty real quick. Um, at the federal level, a lot of times there are entities that get overlooked. And OEC and the, the, the NCIC, the National Cybersecurity Communications Integration Center, and the NCC, which is kind of a partnership of people at this table, from academia, from government, from industry, all partnering to do something we're really, really bad at in public safety communications, which is share information. And it takes, it's like pulling teeth to get 
police chiefs and fire chiefs and sheriffs and EMS administrators to share data because of the nature of their business. One of the things that I think we found kind of models well and gives some of the capabilities that Alex has been talking about and others have mentioned, the ability to, to, to take economies of scale along with advanced technologies to prevent that eventual DDoS attack that may not look attractive now, but tomorrow will just kick us in the pants because of some of those new vulnerabilities and create a true IDPS system, an intrusion detection and prevention system that incorporates multiple capabilities from industry and government and puts eyes on multiple targets. And one of the things that I know Dusty's shop and, and the folks in the NCC have been looking at is how do you create a model that creates an IDPS that is an information sharing environment, mm -hmm. taking advantage of industry while still meeting the unique needs of local public safety. And so Dusty, if you can chat a little bit about that approach, I think maybe that'll give a little more insight. And I will add one more thing. Keep in mind, it's not a matter of if you've been attacked, it's a matter of when. Mm -hmm. So anything is hackable, and we all know that, but from the operational level, we've got to be able to identify that attack quickly, mitigate it, and then figure out how to operate through it so that we can recover from it. Um, and that's kind of what we're, the, the tool set that we're trying to put into public safety's hands mm -hmm. by putting groups like this together and figuring out what the tactical plan needs to be. So, Dusty. Thank you, Jay. Uh, so what Jay was referring to, the FCC uh, a few years ago had a task force on optimal PSAP architecture. Uh, one of the recommendations from that was uh, to develop an emergency communication cybersecurity center, EC3. Uh, the, the role and purpose of an EC3 would be to protect uh, the 911 infrastructure, to protect public safety uh, from uh, cyber attacks. Uh, the, the, the analogy that I give is that when, when we came up with this idea of sending pictures and videos and, and such to, to uh, public safety, uh, the, the next gen 911 idea, it, was, it seemed like a great idea. Now, today, who will open a file from somebody you don't know? But that is exactly what we would be asking the call takers to do, yeah. is to open these pictures, open these data files uh, from somebody they don't know. So how long would a, a critical system stand up uh, in that environment? Uh, an hour, maybe? Um, so the, the purpose and role of, a, of an emergency communication cybersecurity center is, is to be that, that filter, to be that, that DMZ, to uh, identify those, uh, those risks, those targets, to share information with other uh, EC3s across the country and at a national level. Uh, we, we recognize that in the next gen 911 environment, uh, the, the, the threat is always evolving. Uh, what you're protecting today is not what you're, what you're gonna be protecting against tomorrow. Uh, that, I mean, that, that's just the, the way that the, the world is working. But I, I wanna come back just for a moment to, to something that, that Dan mentioned earlier is the current um, the current 911, the legacy 911 environment, because we're not at next gen 911 yet. We're, we're still in, in the old 911, and there is this perception that 911 is 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 just this great big a cloud that, of course, I can dial 911. But on the wireless and wireless environment, there are a limited number of lines, or what we call them trunks, uh, that are going uh, to a 911 center. So, for example, in a community that has perhaps a million people, you'll probably have in the teens uh, the number of lines from wireless carriers that are going to that 911 center. So you only have to get 20 wireless callers and you have occupied every line wireless call going to that 911 center. It, it's not like you have to do hundreds or millions, it's 20. Uh, so that therein is is the one of the, the challenges uh, that we we recognize in the current legacy 911 environment. Um, you can't analyze something you don't receive. So uh, the, uh, the 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 person who is having a heart attack in Dallas 911, they aren't going to get through because they aren't even going to get from the wireless carrier to the 911 center. Yeah, I mean, you know, and there are other federal efforts going on as well um, within NTIA, within the Department of Homeland Security, looking at you know, botnets, for example, and trying to ensure that the, you know, the systems that are out there producing in, in information that ultimately could come into public safety are themselves secure yeah. and that they are continually being updated and that they're patchable and that they're not just, you know, creating malware opportunities left and right. Um, so there's a lot of work going on at the federal level on, on that side as well. Um, Mark, maybe from your perspective at the state and local level, 
What are you seeing out there in the different states that you guys are working in, in terms of local government, state government, individual 911 center preparedness? What are they doing to get ahead of this? So thank you, Patrick. Uh, I would start by echoing Jay's comments about the public safety IT professionals. Um, they have nothing but our admiration. Um, while I do, your, your point is also very, very valid, and they're operating at a, at a, at a hindrance. Yeah, they're dedicated. Yeah. They're super dedicated. Like, I mean, I'm really dedicated to trying to drop 30 pounds, you know, and like, I'm hoping to get there, but my dedication doesn't necessarily take me over the line. They need great companies like Mission Critical Partners and others to get them there, and that means they need budget. So what, what we're seeing, and I think everybody at the table agrees, that the level of preparedness, and that's a theme that's been echoed across discussions on TDOS, DDoS, ransomware, mm -hmm. um, hey, if we have good backups, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a level of preparedness, that's a state of preparedness. So what is the state of preparedness of the 6,000 PSAPs in the United States? And I think everybody at this table would contend that it's very poor, yep. that it's very poor. So what we try to do and what we try to lead and what we try to think about in our discussions with our client base, which are primarily mid-size and smaller PSAPs who are at even a greater hindrance, uh, is what do you do? Mm -hmm. What do you do? What's that first step to preparedness? Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about assessments. Yep. Assessments are affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, get an assessment from an objective third party. It baselines your data set. It baselines your level of risk. It points you in the direction of where you should go first. Mm -hmm. It gives you priorities. But I think at the state level and at the federal level, we should be providing more help. And what we see, Patrick, in uh, certain states like Maryland, the Emergency Number Systems Board funded for every PSAP in the state a cybersecurity assessment. Mm -hmm. I, I think for at the state level, that's completely appropriate. It's achievable. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't, I, I indicated at the conversation before, our biggest challenge is we start to talk to these PSAPs. If we shoot too high, we lose their attention. It's mm -hmm. not achievable. They walk away and nothing gets done. Yep. So I think at a state level, that's achievable. And I think more efforts on that guideline, I think this is gonna continue to evolve, but I think that's a good starting point. And uh, Jay, sorry, if I can just say, and from my point of view as like a, you know, as a bleeding edge solution, meeting and meeting PSAPs for the first time, I say 90% of my job is actually educating what the possibilities are out there, right? Because um, large part as medium and small size PSAPs uh, um, are also um, customers of ours. And every time we meet them, they believe that they are more secure and have resilience because they have um, all their eggs in two baskets. They've got their standard site and they've got their site down the road in the warehouse that they think they're going to get hot in the next four hours. Um, as opposed to, you know, again, a cloud-based distributed system. You know, and that is an education way before that's an engagement in a sales cycle, right? So I, I don't know of any of our clients that don't think they're at tremendous risk. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, I don't know of a client who is yeah, over is who there. is overconfident. Yeah, it's what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think to that point, you're absolutely right. That's the same thing we're hearing. You know, you get not because he's sitting at the table, but you get folks like DC who have some deep capabilities. Who I can tell you from the federal perspective, when I was at DHS, they were a very valuable, reliable partner. We were plugged in with them. There are certain large PSAPs around the country through the same way. They're very aware of the threat, and they have some resources to bring to, to bear. But 70% of the PSAPs in this country are less than five seats. Mm -hmm. And right. those folks need something where you can take the economies of scale and the shared data um, and actually bring them together and, and give them capabilities that no one single three-position PSAP can have. But also to the point of the types of testing that's done. It used to be pen testing was the gold standard, and now that's really not it. I mean, you can do penetration testing all day long, but that's not gonna give you your entire threat landscape. So you have to take kind of a combined approach to how you do that analysis. I know T that TFOPA had a, a, a base level assessment on how to look at your PSAP and just be honest. Uh, what, what, what resources do I have? What do they do? Where are the holes? Obviously, the right vendors and, and partners take that to another level, but the, the federal government also has some resources that public safety can reach out to yeah. through NCATS and through DHS headquarters that will, and, and I would encourage public safety to also look at, because it's free and it's an opportunity to share information, the COM ISAC through the communications ISAC through DHS headquarters, NCC, the OEC and SAFECOM methods are, are 
mechanisms that are out there, places where you can get together public safety to public safety and share information and find out who is doing those threat assessments. How can I get the type of threat assessment my three-position PSAP needs? How can I look at, for, for example, what was mentioned on DDoS? One of the most common misperceptions that we've heard from, even from large PSAP directors, is I don't have a DNS server anywhere in my architecture. And I ask them, do you have a website? Well, yeah, but it's not connected to CAD. Oh, that's okay. Do you check your email inside the PSAP? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that computer connected to a switch? Exactly. Yeah. Gary? Hello, backdoor. Yeah. I am in to your DNS server that you didn't think you had. And, and our concern on the DDoS side has always been not a simple DDoS attack, but the type of DDoS attack that takes down Amazon and Google for four hours, which is that that botnet DNS amplification vector type of attack that most PSAPs don't even know they're vulnerable to. In fact, most public safety agencies don't know. And there are other vulnerabilities in their switches or in their routers that are known threats that have been published that the average 911 center, police department, fire department, EMS agency doesn't even know exist. And if you tell them, those IT folks in less than five minutes can patch a hole that would stop that type of of amplification. But how do you get to your point, Mark, how do you get the information to them? How do we get them trained? And how do we make sure they're aware of all the little threats? It used to be just keeping my browser patched. Now it's, by the way, I've got six switches in my network, and every one of them has a different vulnerability that I need to patch, plus patch the browsers, plus deal with the vendors. And then, to Dusty's point, let's throw in those cell phones. Everybody here is a cyber guy. I love cell phones. It's job security, isn't it? Mm. A smartphone is awesome because keep it on. Yeah, you're, you're also alluding to another thing that we see across a lot of PSAPs, and that is this narrow focus of cybersecurity. Yep. If I protect my CPE network, I'm good. And you're not. If, and you're not. It's mm. got to be holistic. You've got to look. We find vulnerabilities in the admin network that impact the CAD application yep. or the CPE yep. application. You've got to look. You've got to be holistic. everything you can, you must be holistic. So, and one of the things that we right. said, and I'll, I'll seed back over to, to Alex, but we said this in TFO, but we've said it for a number of years. Cybersecurity, we no longer have the luxury of considering it an afterthought. It has to be baked in at the onset. We can't go out and build ESINets or use a cloud-based solution or, or enable one more application or system in our PSAP without thinking about cyber at this point, and if we haven't put cyber on net and we haven't put it in our architecture, you're already behind the eight ball and you're already so vulnerable. Yeah, it has to be, it has to be in the forefront. It has to be considered in RFPs. It has to be part of the daily ops. Again, DC has done some amazing stuff. Houston has done some great stuff. Dallas and LA and Chicago, but they're large PSAPs with budgets and awareness, and and the 70% of the PSAPs out there we have to get out and touch have to do the same thing. It has to be part of the whole picture. So does, I actually think you guys the are, awareness, I actually think yeah. the awareness is more important than the budget, frankly. Yeah. Because Absolutely. most of what oh, most of what we tend to focus on is big picture, big attacks, big stuff. Mm-hmm. But PSAPs right now are getting killed on WannaCry, Heartbleed, stuff that's been yeah, but there's a, yeah. For years. but there's there's a huge reason for this. There is a there is a most of the people who work in public safety don't come out of a background of systems administration. Who's been a sysadmin here? Like in the field, how many people do you know who like have been a lifetime sysadmin? Like very, very, very few people. So staffers in the audience, awesome free resources. Go to the Center for Internet Security. Center for Internet Security is a nonprofit organization. Um, they have published a list of the 20 critical security controls. You can read it. It'll take you five minutes. You will be more well-informed than everybody else who works in cybersecurity you know, in most of the congressional offices, which is like a cool thing to do. Like I was a nerd when I worked here, and it seemed to have relatively paid off to my own arrogance. The, the thing that's important, though, is that there's basically six foundational or basic things that people ha- that organizations have to do in order to be literally just effectively secure. Tony Sager, who's the chief evangelist of the Center for Internet Security, he used to run the NSA's red team, which is like um, where they go and they break holes in applications and they beat the crap out of other products, right? And it's a really big and important job. And Tony will tell you that 90% of the organizations in the world don't do six out of the top 20 things. So if we did the following six things throughout public safety, we would be more secure than like 90% of all the enterprises. And they're, they're hard to do, but they're, they're simple to wrap your head around. This is where awareness comes in, but you also need execution, right? We have to inventory all hardware. 
So just do you know everything that you're supposed to connect to? Most people can't say yes to that question. You can bring in tons of devices that are part of shadow IT projects that then become the, the thing that gets exploited, right? Um, are we inventorying all software? I mean, we, do, we, do you know what's on every single machine inside your enterprise? That free app application that you're like, random admin officer downloaded onto their machine, that can be used as part of an exploitation method that is then targeted, and they're inside your secure network, and so it doesn't really matter how many boxes you have for firewall protection once they're inside your network, right? Do we know that like you're not running a secret Gmail account and sending all of your things through Gmail as opposed to your enterprise work email system? Um, do we have continuous vulnerability management? So do we know when a system is out of date and can be exploited? And most organizations cannot say yes to this. Do we have uh, controlled administrative privileges? So do we know that the guy who was the intern last month, who is now somehow our security guy, doesn't also have all of the stuff for budget and finance, or the other way around? Um, I did a security audit of a company where one employee had been there for 12 years, and he had 95% of all administrative credentials for the entire company, even though he doesn't have any of the roles anymore that the privileges were given to him to do, right? He doesn't have any of those jobs. Yet he still has all of those privileges, which makes that person the actual attack surface. Um, do, we con do we secure the configurations of hardware and software systems? <clears throat> do we know where the providence of that code came from? Was it an application written in China or Pakistan that's now being used for public safety operations? Or was it written in a friendly country? Um, and lastly, do we maintain and monitor all of our logs? Every machine for everything that gets done generates a log, and you can audit that, which is really kind of nice and very helpful. So you can see the truth of actually what happened on a machine by going back and reviewing that information. But you have to know to turn it on. And you have to know how to use it. And you have to know how to run analytics against it. And so. The, the challenge that we have is one of economics, where like lots of people who are really good at this stuff, they gravitate towards larger organizations. And this happens all over the place. Like People don't work in aerospace because they want to work at Pixar. right? A lot of people don't want to work in state and local government IT because they want to go and they want to work for you know, Amazon or Azure. And this creates a problem that we don't do these basic things. So let me ask, let me ask a related question to part of that discussion. And then if anybody in the, in the audience has any questions, by all means, uh, please uh, let me know, and we'll, we'll get those questions answered. Um, on the hardware side, a lot of this has been about software, it sounds to me. Um, um, what about the hardware? I mean, yes, cloud, but there is a lot of equipment in the PSAP, right, or in any public safety agency. So um, what about the, the, the hardware side of it? And one of the, when you talk about cybersecurity in Washington, one of the things you talk about is supply chain, right? Yeah. Um, so and then, you know, who are you buying it from? Who makes the products? I mean, the, the National Defense Authorization Act was just passed not that long ago, and it specifically calls out certain providers. Um, and so I guess the question there is, do we have to be concerned, particularly when the public safety agencies are purchasing equipment, who they're buying it from, and what vulnerabilities might just be built in? So you don't have to be concerned as long as you've scrubbed everything down to the chip level, you're good. Um, so supply, ch yeah, <laughs> supply chain is critical. I think uh, the Defense Authorization Act of 2018, the FCC, and their, their uh, latest notice of proposed rulemaking and several federal agencies have clearly identified, and properly so, that supply chain is a problem. Whether it's a particular vendor that is from an unfriendly nation state that's building a handset or a router, or whether it's those same unfriendly nation states embedding a chip into someone else's device, it is very difficult to protect against, but it's also critical that we manage the hardware side of this very carefully. Uh, there have been concerted efforts that we're all aware of to get hardware on net with major U.S. carriers and into the public safety infrastructure. And we've got to be diligent. And, uh, you know, the larger vendors in this space obviously are. And they're well aware of the threat. They're part of that COM ISAC and a number of other ISACs, uh, information sharing and advisory councils. But it, can, it requires continuous surveillance and diligence. Uh, diligence I'm sorry. And, uh, and we just have to be aware of the fact that if I can get a chip onto a product and get it on net, that's all I need. And one chip on one device in the right critical node of any critical infrastructure will compromise 
can potentially compromise that infrastructure. So it's absolutely critical that hardware be considered part of that equation. And again, from the public safety perspective, and, and I think Teddy can address this better than any of us at the, at the level of local operations, when you write an RFP, you've got to be aware of the threat and you've got to include it in, in your ask um, because if you don't catch it up front, once it's on net, it's too late. And there's no telling what kind of information mm -hmm. could be, could be uh, compromised. And Jay, if, I mean, and, and Patrick, I'm going to upset you now by putting this back into software. Now, um, <laughs> it's my job to get rid of legacy um, CAD. I mean, that's that's my my raison d'être, right? So, um, on on my uh, mission the last year and a bit in America, uh, meeting all kinds of shapes and sizes of PSAPs, I have met PSAP uh, chiefs who have told me that they've been informed that parts of their CAD have been built in places like China, the code base. So we talk about supply chain. I want to pull this right back into software and go, you are, you're even more exploitable if your supply chain is actually, your code base is actually built in a foreign climb, right? So, you know, I, I'm, we've never outsourced any of our, um, any of our, co of our code base. We built that all in the house. And I don't know if there is uh, an, a, um, an audit that uh, you know, DHS can provide you know, against all code base. And I know that the problem with Legacy CAD as well is that you know, there's a myriad code base out there because everyone's running a different version number so no one can patch or keep that you know, current of what they're doing there. So that's another problem. But right now I can tell you, in America today, there are CADs that have components built in China. And, and Steve, I would, I would bring it back to the theme of preparedness. Mm -hmm. The supply chain component grows yeah. in concern and level of importance where my software is written yep. grows in level Absolutely. of importance. Absolutely. And yet this is another variable, and I'm going to bring it back to the PSAP IT director mm -hmm. of a small to mid-sized yep. PSAP. What do I do? Right. Because this is not checklist driven, because the checklist keeps growing changes. and changes all the time. The individuals who are doing this mm -hmm. are intelligent, they're creative, they're innovative, mm -hmm. uh, and the threats continue to grow. Right. So reach out for help. Follow the resources, have an assessment. Um, I think are all really yeah. key first steps. Yeah, and so market to Jay's point. Yeah. Sorry, Teddy, so after you. Go ahead. Yeah, so if I can add um, a few a few topics, a few a few items to this. <laughs> One is I rely on what happens with a lot of the entities that whether it's OEC or APCO, the working that we've had, Nina, and all kinds of organizations. There's a lot of information that comes out, and we're leveraging that information applied into the 911 environment. We also rely heavily on the vendors. We are looking for the vendor community to bake that into their solutions. CAD, whether it's CAD, the radio system, the 911 system, the switches and the routers. So we're really relying on a lot of the you know vendors to provide us that, that system that takes this into account. So, you know, when these things are happening, we're not just trying to do better in house and you know, in awareness, awareness training of all our, whether it's our call taker, dispatcher, IT staff, or whoever but also making sure that these things are being communicated and discussed with the vendors, whether it's a 911 provider, whether it's a CAD provider, whether it's a radio system provider, all the way down to the switching and routing, right? One of the other things that we've done, at least here in the district, we leverage the citywide IT infrastructure and the security teams. So we're not doing this in isolation and just thinking that it's just a 911 center, but we're also leveraging what else is happening in the city. Because all these systems, whether we like it or not, at, at some point are interconnected. Um, so we got to make sure we're, we're just doing a global view of things in the district and any other jurisdiction yeah. for that matter than just looking at it from a 911 perspective and as we go along and make sure we educate our staff and things like that, but yeah. really extending it out to the call taker level that you don't just open an email when somebody sends it to you and you work on a CAD workstation or, you know, you're on a Wi-Fi and you're doing something on your phone and, you know, unfortunately you might end up downloading something. So. These are the kind of things we're working on. Yeah, and and, and just uh, and trying to tie it back to that and to what Jay was saying, you know, is this um, you leveraging the economies of scale of what you're doing, Teddy? And then we have the legacy CAD environment with you know, no one really speaks of this. This kind of tiered environment where I've got a tier one CAD because I'm a big city with more budget, and I've got a tier two CAD because I'm a small medium city. Oh, and I'm a rural piece up in West Texas. Well, I've got an Excel spreadsheet and a walkie-talkie, right? And so that is uh, you know, the the lack of interoperability, which speaks to kind of Dusty's uh, themes and and how you're actually stronger if you can actually share data correctly is one point as well. 
Um, and the, the fact that we're sitting in the NG91 Institute right now, and CAD has gone from being this ancillary, you know, incident ticketing system <clears throat> to being the message broker of everything in NG91. We talk about getting the message from the phone call and taking it straight to the boots in the ground. It goes through CAD. That's the only way you're going to pass that SIP header media from uh, um, out in the call straight down the boots in the ground. So if CAD is the message broker and interoperability is so important, this is something we need to leverage the, you know, the power of scale to, to achieve this. Mm. And that's why I'm sitting here evangelizing cloud. And L last question, um, unless folks from the audience have any questions. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Dusty. Yeah, if, if I can just add uh, something, the, considering the audience, uh, most of our conversation have, have focused on the state and local level. Yeah. And there are approximately 6,000 PSAPs across the country at the state and local level. There are also about 1,000 federal PSAPs. Mm -hmm. The federal PSAPs typically are not uh, nearly as advanced as the state and local PSAPs. Uh, typically, they are buried in uh, the appropriations language somewhere uh, within the, uh, the department or agency. Uh, and you will very often find that if you ask um, many of the, the departments and agencies, they don't know uh, that they have PSAP. So certainly they aren't preparing for this next generation 911 environment. They aren't thinking of the, uh, the challenges and the funding associated with that. Yeah, that's a good point. And, f and we've said PSAP probably about 612 times. If you're not living in our world, a PSAP is a public safety answering point or a 911 center in case anyone's confused. So last question, which is we are in Washington. Um, this, and, you know, this is where the seat of the federal government is. This is where the Congress is. Um, and it is a state and local system. It, it has been and will be in terms of the response to emergencies. But what is the most effective thing that the federal government can do, whether it's funding or through policy, mm -hmm. to help with this? Uh, I mean, from my perspective, one of the things I always look at is, is funding, but not just funding just to give money out, but can we use it in a way that affects change, i.e., can we provide significant amounts of funding, but can we make it contingent upon things that need to be done, i.e., really important cybersecurity measures that need to be taken. Um, but beyond funding, or is it funding, what is the most important thing that the federal government can do from your all's perspective? Uh, Rob, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, set a standard. You know, I mean, what are the expectations, not just at the state and local level, but at the federal level? And what are those expectations, in, how, and how are they delivered? You or, know, I, or adopt. Or adopt, standard. right, yeah. Is it, is it I, a regulation, know, I, or is it a best practice? Well, I, I sit on a, a couple boards that uh, help, mold the the NIST standard for for rural telcos okay so um, and when you talk about the PSAPs and 70 percent of them are rural and and what's the standard and how is it going to be able to be adopted by somebody in Aurora Nebraska where the PSAP is a is a two seat um, is a two seat PSAP and and both the dispatchers are also responsible for making coffee mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah. I mean I mean and that's real I mean yeah. you yeah. know yeah. Hamilton people Right, and Hamilton and Hamilton's based in Aurora, Nebraska, four thousand people. Now we have offices in seven different states, but what is the expectation? You know, how do you meet a standard if you don't know what the expectations are? And when the expectations aren't met, lives are lost. You know, so at what point does somebody step in? You know, uh, federal government, local, state. At this point, we'd take state. You know, and have them say that. This is the standard. This is how you meet it. This is the expectations so that when there's some accountability there, everybody perks up, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When somebody's held to a standard, when the accountability is there, everybody knows what they need to do to be successful. They know what things to chase. They know what mm -hmm. things to implement. They know to reach out to a Hamilton or, or to your company or to your company and say, look, we're deficient here, you know? Yeah. And then to touch real quick on... on a comment that Jay made is that when you are sitting in a in a position of education where you have the ability to educate that PSAP or the 70%, Hamilton has a responsibility from a public safety standpoint mm -hmm. to get your butt out there, educate these people. How can I help? You know, it's not always about the dime. Yeah. It's not always about the paycheck. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I'm an Army veteran. You know, I've served a couple deployments. I didn't do that to get rich either. Right. I took a pay right. cut to do it with the National Guard. Mm -hmm. The point is, is that at what point do we take the, the responsibility as just good people with the resources to educate the individuals that need it mm -hmm. 
and go out to the peace apps, literally walk in on Hamilton's dime and say, hey, guys, have you looked at your switches? Hey, we've got this tool that can monitor everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and so from a public service standpoint, you know, I want to say, you know, 100%, I agree with you when it comes to money is not, we live in a world where money is very, very important. And it's nice to hear that there's some people out there still that believe that money isn't the biggest thing and mm -hmm. that you can go out and you can say, look, you're doing this wrong and I'm going to fix it for you. And the next time you feel like you need some help, I hope you call me. Call. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But if you don't, call someone. Yeah. Um, sorry, can I and just go back to this. Uh, the point I made uh, in the last statement about NG901 and CAD being the nexus of all this messaging um, is that by far, uh, uh, far and away, uh, the 901 tariff across all states very rarely allows for budget for CAD. So if we're going to start talking about NG911, you've got to talk about fixing the funding gap that addresses um, funding CAD. And then, if I can turn that on its head, side. Why are you so focused on funding for CAD, Steve? Um, uh, I don't, I'm a CPE <laughs> vendor, haven't you heard? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I have customers who can't afford to buy a solution, um, even from us. And again, um, talking about not wanting to go for, for, from a money point of view, SAS enables and democratizes the whole of public safety, yep. right? So that solutions as a service being able to charge by scale. So the exactly the same way the funding mechanism works for 911, which is your population density, tells you how much money you're getting. Well, your population density also um, predicts how the, the size of your agency and accordingly how much you should pay. So, so let, me, let me jump in real quick on a point that I think is um, near and dear to operational folks from the perspective of what could the federal government do. Uh, always funding, that's always a, an issue. We all know how hard it is to come up to Capitol Hill and ask for money. I think there's something that, that unfortunately failed to happen that needs to be put back in the forefront. The telecommunicators that work at support staff 24-7, 365, those 6,000 plus PSAPs, are not clerical personnel. They've been yeah, named completely. clerical personnel for decades, and they're not. They have emergency medical dispatch capabilities. They deliver life-saving instructions over the phone. They yes. deploy. I deployed on three hurricanes with DHS, and you know who I deployed with? I deployed with telecommunicators from local 911 centers in trucks and in tents who were out taking emergency calls in the field. If the federal government can help elevate and recognize the fact that these are public safety professionals, mm -hmm. that gives us more legitimacy as we continue to come up and rally the folks on Capitol Hill to understand that the traditional PSAP has really morphed into an emergency communication center of the future that becomes what we referred to in the military as a C3 node. Yeah. So command, communications command and control is what it's all about. And a 911 call is not going to get to those valuable responders if it doesn't get through a PSAP. And it can't get to the PSAP with multimedia data and all the, the rich capabilities that the average 16-year-old has on his or her cell phone until we've moved into a next-gen environment. So I think it's a combination of recognizing the professionals that do the work, do the work recognizing that they are public safety professionals, and then creating a truly interoperable multimedia environment so that next gen 911 becomes a reality, yeah. not just a, a catchphrase. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll continue my role as the fun firebrand on the panel. Um, so I, I'm not entirely certain that more funding is always the right answer. I think like there's, so most of all of this comes down to incentive structures. And you can boil a lot of, like, why don't we have the best-in-class cybersecurity people in the world working on public safety? And we should, because it's incredibly important, and they should absolutely work there. But incentive structures don't always dictate that outcome, right? So the idea of more money isn't necessarily the right option. I would actually pose that there should be perhaps a lot less money for people and organizations who don't follow really good standards, right? Like, we've never been more aware of cybersecurity than we are right now. Raising awareness is not necessarily the answer. There's checklists and guides and box things that we could do all day long. NIST 853 was published like 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the NGSEC standard, the NINA Next Generation 911 Security Standard, has been published for like at least six or seven years. DHS has run multiple risk assessments. APCO has run multiple risk assessments. We've never been more aware than we are today. At the national so, level, maybe. Yeah, well, sure. But like, then why, why if I have all this information available to me and I choose not to follow it, and my neighboring PSAP 
chooses to follow it, should we get the same amount of funding? I think this is about negative incentives. I think people who knowingly engage in IT malpractice, which is what cybersecurity professionals think reckless disregard for running a operation effectively from a security perspective looks like, I don't think they should get the same amount of funding. If, you, if you're not high enough to ride this ride, then it's really difficult for me to say with taxpayer money that you should legitimately be able to use that, especially in a world where you can outsource most of this away you can make a lot of this not your problem anymore. You can require that problem to be managed by Microsoft, by Amazon Web Services, by a Hamilton, by Mission Critical Partners, by you have all these options. So in that world, I don't really see more money as necessarily the most important thing. There needs to be a lot more funding, but it has to come with hooks that you do a relatively efficient job and you're not putting life and safety at risk over expediency. And by the way, this comes back to the RFP point, right? So why are people still today RFPing for the system they had 20 years ago? Because that's what the admin knows he uses. And then to take a, a model that seems to work, if you look in Virginia, you know, any solution that is a cloud solution is given priority um, in uh, there's some Virginia legislation we're working through at the moment. So that is the kind of you know, um, blueprint that we need to actually roll out across state and local and actually help um, guide the way with a carrot and a stick. So okay. cloud can be extremely useful, and I realize it's your industry, and we do a, a decent amount with private clouds, but cloud in and of itself isn't any more or less secure. It gives you more options. Mm -hmm. But the real challenge is taking an inventory of what you're running, mm -hmm. and really what it comes back to is, is there a standard or some kind of reference that can be cited that you can then hold people accountable to? Because if you're going to try and hold people accountable and you want to push people to the cloud, and I've, I've built cloud, I like cloud, yeah. how do you hold people accountable when the actual standard, the NINA standard is eight, nine years old and was eight, nine years old when it was written? The, it still works. You know, it it's does system, it? It's system agnostic. It doesn't say, like, you have to manage a Look, ecosystem any, this way. Any security standard that says you have to have saran wrap in your server room yeah. might need to be updated. There's a building engagement okay. word called NIST that you should have a conversation with then. Yeah, I, <laughs> but, but having that reference standard, whether that's a standard, whether that's regulatory, having some kind of reference that, that a 911 operator specifically can look at, yeah. because they're not going to go out to NIST, even when it's referred to, they look at it, they see it's too big. Some of the larger ones do, but the medium Great. and the smaller ones don't necessarily. Right? Having something that's for them that they can engage and use that, I think, is a very doable, achievable solution and would be very helpful. We also, and we also want a scalable solution so every oh, PSAP, the 70% of PSAP show rural can actually benefit from. Um, so I would not, I mean, there are many ways I can come back to this, but the one point I want to come across is I will certainly never endorse maintaining legacy systems just for the benefit of waiting for a standard that comes along to, that suits you. No, I think the legacy systems are actually making us significantly more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm glad we All agree right, on so, that. So, anyway... Uh, this has been a productive discussion, some differences of opinion on some issues, but I think we can all agree that uh, this is a critically important issue um, that uh, is a national imperative, uh, and there's a lot of good, smart people and companies and government employees out there working on it, uh, but it's something that definitely has to be addressed, uh, and uh, I hope it's something that all policymakers, federal, state, and local, are paying attention to. Uh, so I want to thank my panelists, and I want to thank our sponsors, as always, for making these events possible. Uh, please join me in thanking the panelists. <coughs>